It's 2 a.m. in the middle of the night. My phone beeps and glows. Babe, I can't live without you. Hey, it's dark in front of me. My heart is in pain. Am I screwed up already? Hey, I'm in the other world now. The constant WhatsApp notifications and scary messages. I was dismayed that the other world was within range of my phone. I was also disgusted with myself for dating such a man. Hi, I'm Jenny. I've been longing for a job since I was a little girl. I am 27 years old, working hard every day. My friends are starting to get married here and there, but I still enjoy spending time and money for myself. I have a boyfriend, George, whom I have been dating for a year. We have been friends for a long time at our university. I was surprised when he suddenly confessed his feelings for me last year. But he is refreshing and has a sincere personality, so I accepted it willingly. I gladly accepted. He must know that I am a workaholic. I was hoping that he would support me to work hard. However, this man was the type who would change once we become lovers. One Wednesday, I was dragging my exhausted body after a hard day's work. I boarded the train on the opposite platform from my house. I headed for his apartment. As soon as I rang the intercom, he opened the door with a rush. Jenny, you're late. I missed you. I lightly push aside the 27-year-old man who tries to mimic crying at the doorway and enter the room. I told you, I was going to be late due to a meeting today. I miss you, you know? Yes, yes. Jenny, that was cold. You used to be so nice to me. Really? I brush off his dissatisfied expression as he puffs out his cheeks. I heat up the half-price sticker lunchbox I bought at the supermarket in the microwave. Although he came home first and called me over, he doesn't even make me a cup of tea. Listening to him babbling on and on, I ate my meal, put the garbage away in a plastic bag, and got up. What? You're leaving already? I have work tomorrow. Oh, I'll miss you. Why don't you just stay? It's a long way from work. I'll come visit you again this weekend. Huh? I almost let out a sigh at the man pouting his lips. I miss you, I miss you, I miss you. It's all he keeps saying. I mean, I miss you too, because you insist on seeing me. I came to his apartment in the middle of the week in the opposite direction from my own house. He doesn't even know how I feel and he stares up at me with staring eyes. And then he says the usual line. I know, we should get married soon and live together, don't you think? <laughs> good night. I said a quick goodbye to him and covered his lines. I left the room as if to run away. As a friend, he was honest and straightforward. But as soon as we became lovers, he turned into a spoiled dependent type. Daily, good morning, I'm on my lunch break with a picture of his meal. I'm back home message is a matter of course. At bedtime, I'm lonely to go to bed alone. He expects me to call him until he falls asleep. On weekends, of course, he is all over me. And when I try to go home on Sunday night, he stops me with crying. I can understand if we are just getting to know each other. Does he really love me that much? Some woman might be like, oh my god, he loves me so much. But I went out with him in the first place because I thought he was easygoing. I had no way of knowing that he would be so attached to me at all hours of the day. And it had been like this for the entire year we had been dating. Furthermore, while I was staying at his apartment, he forced me to do all the housework. In fact, he doesn't even vacuum on weekdays because I do it on weekends the garbage from his lunch boxes and cup noodles that he would have eaten for dinner. The trash are piled up in the sink for the whole week. He puts all this on me, leaning on me like that, which made me exhausted both physically and mentally. While he could sense my exhaustion and frustration, he has no idea what's wrong with him, just because he was lonely, and just because he wants to hold on to me. He says, let's get married, right off the hook. Recently, he asked me, if we have a baby, can we be together forever? 
he started to say such a disturbing thing. A child with him is outrageous. This man is like a big baby. I've known him as a friend for a long time, so I have sentimental feelings for him. We have a lot of mutual acquaintances, so it's a little awkward to break up with him. Moreover, his outward appearance is fresh and good looking, so people like him. If I make a bad move, I might become the bad guy and people might not like me. Still, I can't think of marrying him because I can't stand him. I began to think seriously about breaking up with him. One day out of the blue, I received a message from him saying, I have something important to tell you. Is he seriously going to propose to me? Or did he finally run out of love with me, the cold, workaholic person I am? I feel bad that I hope it's the latter. Depending on what he said, I decided to break up with him and arranged to meet with him. The day of our agreement, at the coffee shop where we were meeting, what came out of his mouth were unexpected words. I... I have cancer. What? I was stunned by what I had not imagined at all. Is it bad? When I asked him fearfully, he nodded his head while trembling. If I have an operation, it might be cured. But if it fails, I will probably have six months remaining. Oh no! The word life remaining made the blood in my head drop suddenly. I don't know what to say to him. He smiled brightly at me as if he feared for me. I'm sorry. You're busy and I have to talk to you about this. Uh, don't worry about me. I'm just worried about you. Thank you. You're really kind. That's not true. No, that's not true at all. Because I've been thinking about breaking up with you because your love was too heavy for me. Without even noticing that you were sick. He holds my hand with a serious face. I'm such a pathetic person, but will you support me? Even the doctors have said it. He says that if I have hope to live, I might be able to overcome this. You are the most important person in the world to me. George. When I get better, will you marry me? What? You don't have to answer me right now. I'll wait for your answer. With that, he patted my head and left the restaurant before I could. I was left with the words the rest of my life and marriage. I couldn't get up. For the next half month, all I could think about was him. I thought I was having such a bad time that I wanted to break up with him. I only remembered the good times. If he only had a few days left to live, I want to support him until the end. I want to do what I can if my existence is the source of life for him. But when he asks me to marry him, I hesitate. Even if he sensed it, would I be able to spend the rest of my life with him? Is that what I want for my life? I cry every day with anxiety, sadness, and hesitation. I was unable to come up with an answer. At that time, I happened to run into his mother at the train station. He used to take me to his parents' house often, so I knew his mother well. Oh, Jenny, it's been a while. Hi, ma'am. Seeing her talking to me with a nice, friendly smile, I felt a squeeze in my chest. If her son goes ahead of her, such a smile will fade away. I felt sick to my stomach. And with that momentum, I bowed deeply to his mother. Ma'am, please let me marry George. What? She rolled her eyes. Of course, if someone suddenly asks you to let her marry your son in front of a train station, you can't help but be puzzled. She could not help but be perplexed. So I said my thoughts as best as I could. Even if George has only six months left to live, I want to support him as his wife until the end. What? I will study about the disease and do my best to be useful, so... Oh, wait a minute. What are you talking about? What? What do you mean George has only six months to live? What? What? It was my turn to open my eyes at her words. Confused, I told her what he had told me about his illness. She sighed deeply, holding her head. I'm sorry, Jenny. That's just his crazy story. Huh? He's been trying to get people's attention for a long time. 
making exaggerated pleas for something that wasn't even a serious illness. Even though he's not even very sick, he's always used a fake illness. I can't believe he still does that now that he's grown up. And no way, but... The fact that I don't know about George's illness is proof of that. There's no way he wouldn't have told us, given his personality. What? No way. Then what's the point of me crying for the past half months? Jenny. She has just exposed her son's lie. She drops her gaze apologetically. His illness and six months to live are all lies. Probably a way to get my attention and get me to marry him. Anger welled up in my head as I realized the situation. I had cried out in distress, and I had offered to marry him with a determination to devote my life to him. All of it, all of it, was to satisfy that man's selfish desires. Disgusting. 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 Of course, there was no way I would marry such a scumbag. Any remaining feelings I had for him were completely gone. I resolved to cut him off mercilessly, but there was still a chance that he would make me look bad. So I asked his mother to keep quiet about his lies, and to enlist the cooperation of those around him. A week later, I visited him at his apartment. Jenny, I'm so glad you came. He greets me with a weak smile and voice. I'm already sick of just seeing that face that has won me over with his auspiciousness. In my mind, I'm doing him a favor. He is smirking at me for accepting his proposal, but that charade and our relationship will end today. You look better than I thought you would. He froze when he saw the big guy who had just popped up from next to me. Dom? Oh, what are you doing here? That's my line. I told you to come to me first when you get sick, didn't I? Tom, me, and George went to school together. He has a lot of willpower in his family. He himself is a firefighter who wants to use his muscles to his advantage. I'm glad she asked for my advice. I took full advantage of my connections and asked her to see me at the university hospital where my dad is. I asked that they see you as a second opinion. Let's go there now. Ugh. Leaving Tom to deal with the sudden turn of events, I left the room. Let's hold out hope until the end. I'll support you too. Well, how about the marriage then? Let's go. No, I'm fine. Don't be afraid, you're a jerk to be shy to me. Oh no, that's not what I meant. George was squirming and resisting. But he was no match for Tom's straightforward personality, energy, and strength. He was taken to the hospital to be tested for a cancer that never existed. The test results were, of course, healthy. Normally, I would have hugged him with tears in my eyes and said, I'm so happy for you. This time, however, things were different. The hospital he went to had misdiagnosed his condition. When the doctor asked him for the name of the hospital, there was no way he could answer the question. Tom easily found out his lie. Of course, he had to force Tom's father in the hospital to make arrangements for him to see a doctor. Tom, who had arranged the medical examination, was furious. I got Tom a viewpoint and witness, and bullishly accused him of lying. After being pursued by me and Tom, he opened up and said what I expected him to say. Because Jenny won't marry me. He answers like a spoiled child. Tom, who knew only the surface of his health and well-being, opened his mouth. I tugged at him and told him. Let's break up now. I absolutely detest to be married to you. Why? It's just a cute little lie. When I told you I didn't have long to live, you loved me so much that you decided to marry me. And now that I'm alive and well, you should be relieved. The only reason I bothered to consider marrying you was because I felt sorry for you and your family. And even then, I was lost in that stupid lie. It's more like a downside. I have nothing but disgust for you. No, you don't. You keep coddling me, and to top it all off, you tell lies that are so appalling. How could I ever want to be married to someone like you? 
I said in a sub-zero voice, and he finally seemed to understand the situation. Then he burst into tears and cried out, No, 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 no. I refuse to even break up with you, Jenny. Wah. The big man was doing everything he could to get out of his misery. Tom, the big muscular guy, is backing away. I was a little relieved to see that this was still a bizarre sight. I pushed Tom off his back, unable to take my eyes off the strange man, and we walk out of the apartment. George, noticing that I was not at all distracted, rushes over to me. Wait, 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 Jenny. See, I can't live without you. That's another lie, right? No, it's not. Once you tell a flat-out lie, you'll never be trusted again. Goodbye. Whoa. I left George bawling like a howling wolf. I closed the door to his apartment. Thus, I had finally parted with the man who looked like a baby crying old man. Tom, who had cooperated with me, he explained in detail to the people around me why I had broken up with George. Most of my friends began to show up for me. Some of my friends tilted their heads and said, that's enough lying. I showed them a video I had secretly saved of him being a spoiled brat and they shut up. One of them was a female friend of George's. She's not a bad person, but she is very light-mouthed. She spread the facts as they were within her small industry. He was the guy who forced her to marry him by falsely claiming he only had six months to live. He lost credibility as a member of society and as a human being. He was a good-looking guy on the outside, hence the gap between the two. People seem to have been turned off by him. Of course, George is not convinced otherwise. Immediately after our breakup, he sent me messages every day to the point that my phone was about to go flat. From poems begging me to come back, to the kind of thing that a child would report to his mother about the day's events. I can get through those, though. The most exhausting are the lines from the other side of the world that come in the middle of the night. Mostly it's because I can't live in a world without Jenny. Jenny, I can't breathe. Ah, it's dark in front of me. Help me, Jenny. It seems I've come to the other side. This is how it ends. I'm a little moved by the possibility. However, the last line made me lose my mind. And then, he who should have gone to the other world. The next day, he sends me a normal message as usual. It's crazy, even insane. Once, I am George's mother came from his message. My son is very sick and waiting for you, Jenny, in the hospital room. I received a message saying, I'm sorry, I took the plunge and contacted his real mother. And when his mother visited his room, he was lying on his bed watching TV and laughing. After that, he told me that he would never lie to me again. So, I got a message from him asking me not to tell his parents. Apparently, he was stiffed by his strict father. I think blocking his contacts will solve the problem. But it is not such an easy problem. I am afraid that if I cut off contact with him, he will retaliate in a panic. It is difficult to find the right timing. Of course, after I broke up with him, I did not go home. I have been staying at a friend's house. I can't stay there for long, though. It was right around that time that the company was talking about launching a new messenger. I took the initiative and raised my hand to take the case. I packed up my apartment and got on the train to the new location. I blocked his contact number. Thus, I was able to disassociate myself from that foolish and pathetic man. Five years later, I am now 33 years old and still working as hard as ever. But on my left right finger is a platinum ring. A ring which I didn't have back then. Actually, six months ago, I got married to a colleague from my office. My husband was attracted to the way I seemed to enjoy my work. He promised to support me so that I could continue working after marriage. We both share the household chores, so there are no major burden that interferes with my work. We have also decided to work together to raise our children. Friends who work with George occasionally report his dire situation. He has lost his credibility and his work is not going well. Apparently, even when he gets a new girlfriend, he is quickly dumped. Even at 27, he's in pain, but he's now a 33-year-old man. 
It would be an even worse sight if a 33 year old guy was turning into a baby. And he seems to be constantly looking for me saying, I'm sure Jenny will return. And he seems to be looking for me. And he's saying Jenny is just being mean. He says that someone should tell me that George is not mad at me and to come home. And apparently he's also having horrible delusions of being a good guy. Of course, there is no way my friends will help him with that. Instead, they get angry and just leave him on his own. I am so glad that I kept the people around me on my side. And he is a very lonely person. He must be very much distressed by his loneliness. Relationships between lovers and married couples that only depend on one person for support will be exhausted and will fail. So he closes his eyes to the unpleasant aspects of the relationship. I'm so glad I wasn't carried away. I am very glad that I did not decide to get married. I met my husband who is the most understanding and supportive person. I was able to have a family while continuing to do the work I love. I truly feel happy from the bottom of my heart.